Today we are going to talk about two of the players that may be the most undervalued or the biggest steals in fantasy football drafts. They are players that we've talked about on rotaviz.com as we'll talk about today with our guest, but we are also talking about these players a lot. And I still think at their prices, they are criminally undervalued. And that means that they're pretty easy to get on your rosters, but you want to also try and get those you know, ADP values on them as well. So not taking them two or three rounds above ADP. As some people have joked with me, I've done a number of drafts recently with Tom Strachan on the Road of His YouTube channel, along with the uh, Fantasy Sanctuary channel, which he is part of. And on those shows, you know, it's basically been taking Trey McBride every time. And this week he asked me, at what point of the draft are you willing to take Trey McBride? Because we did miss on him at the 3-4 turn. But, uh, you know, there is certain players like the players we're going to discuss today. You can get them on the roster very easily based on the rankings on rotaviz.com. But balancing that out with, you know, trying to work a draft room is the other element of it. So we are joined today by Kevin. Kevin's been on before, Kevin Safranyuk. And we're going to talk through a number of articles that he is up on rotaviz.com talking about these particular players but as we get ready to welcome kevin and i do want to say that this is you know we talk about time zones sometimes on the podcast with myself and sean and where we are uh, across the world and sean at this point in time as we're recording this it's like 2 a.m sean's time so sean has had the the episode off for this edition but kevin is here and this is a for the love of the game recording time he is recording this one at 5 30 a.m eastern I am over here in Ireland. It is 10.30 a.m. my time. So this is a, a fun one. I mentioned before we started recording with Kevin that over the years, I've done some episodes at crazy times. We did a draft a couple of years ago, myself and Sean and Zachary Kruger, where the, the joke was that Jimmy Garoppolo isn't somebody that you get up at 2 a.m. <laughs> to draft. Uh, and uh, I've done shows from Australia and linking those up with the U.S. times as a, a challenge too. But Kevin, welcome in and much appreciation for the early recording time the other part i have to say is uh, i hope that you're well stocked up on on caffeine and coffee at this time of the morning to get through this episode oh yeah absolutely uh they say it's the best way to kick off off the morning it's all downhill from here as soon as i hit work it's just it'll just be all downhill yeah it could it could be tricky uh, you might have that afternoon you know drop off uh, so we'll see how that occurs throughout the rest of your day but wishing you all the best at work but we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts here on two pieces that you have written up on rotaviz lots of content from kevin recently and i have to say it's must read it's fantastic uh, to have him up on the site and to get to read through these it's also fantastic when it's two players that i absolutely love that we're going to discuss today so we're going to jump in first with a running back we're going to follow up then with a tight end Hey, tight end could be anybody. We love tight ends over here on Road of His Overtime. But the first player up, I'm going to let Kevin reveal who it is, but he mentions that this player is still criminally undervalued and then deciphering the possible outcomes for this particular backfield because it's not just one running back that is in there. Who is the backfield and who is the running back we're going to discuss today? So the the first player up today is Jalen Warren and this is like a full disclosure. So generally when I'm writing these articles, it's a lot of the time it's just players that I'm taking a lot of. And sometimes I need to justify my exposures to these players. So uh, Jalen Warren was definitely one of those, especially kind of this year, how Najee Harris is actually, it seems like the first year that he's actually draftable at his ADP. So I really wanted to take a look at both of those players and see, you know, where, where really is the value and how should we be playing the backfield? Because, um, I mean, when, once those exposures get up to twenty percent, twenty five percent, it's it's really good to really know what uh, what you're getting yourself into. So, basically, that's as far as uh, the Steelers' backfield. I uh, really just wanted to see where where I really thought that that they would end up at the end of the year. So that's what we're going to talk through at the start here before we get into the tight end that I mentioned. But looking at the exposures i think it's a very good point is sometimes we can blindly just continue to draft these players and it is important as well to you know have the range of outcomes and where they could end up because you know jalen warren is the player on the docket but when we are drafting huge amounts of him or you know the player that i am kind of joking about a little bit but how much i draft a tight end would be trey mcbride for example or sam laporta and when you're drafting the elite tight ends i've a lot of my draft strategy so far this season has been getting two of those t tight ends through the opening nine rounds and you have to be aware too like if you are drafting a lot of Trey McBride and 
you don't even have to talk about week one, week two, week three. If he has an injury in training camp, then all of a sudden your you know your whole draft plan is in a, a difficult situation. So you have to be aware of how you're trying to balance it out and also being aware of the you know the upside potential, but also the drastic downside is one hit for all these players and those players are out for the season. So the players that you're making those selections off, you need to have them kind of backed up with you know a certain reason. So when we get into the situation, we have Jalen Warren and Najee Harris in the backfield. And Harris, for a player who, like I had, you know, completely avoided for the majority of his career drafting, he had a pretty okay, I, I'm not going to say great year, but a pretty okay year overall last season. Jalen Warren didn't hit the, you know, outcome last season that we were hoping for, but we we're taking a step forward. But there's a lot of change as well in Pittsburgh. We have you know, new offensive coordinator there with Arthur Smith. Uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't talk about Arthur mm-hmm. Smith uh, <laughs> in this one, but uh, he is there, but he loves to run the ball. So we have two running backs in the situation. Um, will he be overpowered by, you know, Mike Tomlin, the head coach, just want to, how he wants to this offense to go? That's going to be interesting to see. But we have two different quarterbacks. So it's not just the Kenny pick. It's not the option. It's that we have Russell Wilson, who's come in after a, you know, a, a a really train wreck of a situation after he got traded from the Steelers to the Broncos. Now, obviously with the pits or from the Seahawks to the Broncos rather now with the Steelers. And we also have Justin Fields who was traded away from the Chicago bears to the Steelers. So there's a lot of moving parts here. We also have Deontay Johnson, who's now with the Carolina Panthers. So a, a lot of movement just, I guess, is the overall takeaway for the Steelers this year. Mm-hmm. How are you breaking that down in terms of what you looked at in the article for let's say Jalen Warren's outlook, but also factoring in Najee Harris from 2023 to 2024. What's the kind of overview of the entire situation? We'll start. I mean, I think Arthur Smith, Arthur Smith and the quarterbacks are both like the biggest confounding variables because it's just all new. Like you said, uh, I mean, Arthur Smith, really one of the reasons that when I when I first brought this article up, I, just, I, I said I really wanted to compare him to Voldemort. Like, that, that was like one of my, I don't know if that should be one of the driving factors for writing an article, but, you know, just kind of have a little fun with, with the whole Arthur Smith, uh, yeah. the Arthur Smith aspect of it. But actually, so when he was with uh, Tennessee, you know, he had the second highest rush rate for the two years that he was the offensive coordinator there. But they ran the second fewest plays, and it pretty much continued in Atlanta. So what we know is, is he's going to be running a, a run-heavy offense and a slow offense. Uh, so that's kind of that's not really what we want to hear going into, you know, a new situation with players that we really enjoy. So I was kind of uh, looking at that. There are a few things that that when he moved to Atlanta kind of are a little more promising is when he went there, when he was with Tennessee, obviously you have Derrick Henry there, not catching a lot of passes, but in that first year in Atlanta, he did, he, he, there ended up being 127 targets to the backs, which was, that was the, the, when I was looking at this, in 2021 was the Mike Davis and Cordero Patterson year. And that seemed like it was a lot longer ago to me than it was yeah. 2021, <laughs> but they did uh, have a they combined for 127 targets there, which was promising when you, when you factor in Warren, uh, cause last year Warren had a 15% target share. So we're hoping that that can, we can keep that up. Uh, and even though the targets fell in 2022, the backs did have over a hundred targets again last year. So, I mean, the biggest thing with Arthur Smith is, is just unpredictability. Uh, when he was, you know, last year, I thought saving his job, I'm like, going into last year, I really, I was heavy on the Falcons offense, just thinking that, you know, he was going to, he was going to just feed Drake London, Kyle Pitts, and B. John Robinson, just because he was already on the hot seat. Everybody could pretty much see that, that he probably wasn't going to have a job. So I figured to save his job, he would lean into those guys, and he did not. So it's just, uh, we're, I, I think it's just really hoping that Mike Tomlin maybe reins him in because I don't really have a lot of trust in Arthur Smith doing things that are beneficial to fantasy. And I know coaches aren't playing for fantasy players, but at the same time, it doesn't really seem like Arthur Smith was even Arthur playing. Smith certainly isn't playing for fantasy players. Like <laughs> no. in, uh, he, he has said as much as that uh, uh-huh. numerous times. But that is obviously that you're we're trying to figure out what's going to happen based on what we expect and mm-hmm. uh, the outcomes that could happen. But they obviously it's not part of their job to care about what we think or what we're doing but when we look at a couple of other parts you mentioned you know the situation with 
know, 2022 with Arthur Smith, Tyler Algier, who at the time was a fifth round rookie running back. You mentioned the article, he had 1,000 yards rushing. Uh, we had Patterson that year with almost 700 yards rushing. Um, and, you know, he, I have to say, that was a, an amazing <laughs> zero RB season <laughs> from Patterson, who was going like in the undrafted to 20th round in a lot of the FFPC formats, for example. But he also had eight Russian touchdowns in 13 games. Uh, but over the course of the season, I guess, we, you know, or over the course of the trajectory, it's the downside that we remember last year from, you know, having Algier and B. John Robinson and what I think the expectations were for those guys, along with Pitts and Drake London heading into the season. That is what, you know, it was the opposite end of the spectrum. One felt like a big overachievement, and the other felt like a drastic underachievement. The other part with the quarterbacks then to factor in, you know, Russian quarterbacks, and this is something that I, I always tie to Zachary Kruger's name, with Russian quarterbacks not targeting the running backs as often. And that's kind of something we've seen between Russell Wilson and, and Justin Fields obviously scrambling quite a bit. How have you found with both of those guys? And just on that, have you a preference on, on who's the starter? And then is there any kind of upside to either of these being the starter tied to the running back or do you think it's a similar situation for these rbs regardless of who's the quarterback i think it's generally how how you're looking at the situation because if we're wanting obviously just like you said it's not very very it's not a mystery that that rushing quarterbacks aren't generally good for pass catching running backs so if if you really want to play the the running backs and have them get a bunch of passing volume I mean, Russ just seems like he's the, the, the clear option, unfortunately, because Fields, I'm not drafting any Russ. Uh, so if anything, I'm drafting Fields at the end just for the fact that he, he would take over the job and, and you know, he could, he could blow up during the playoffs or any week, really. So uh, just some stats that just looking through, through those two players, I saw that I found that Fields only had uh, a running back over 300 yards and a 10% target share twice. And it was both, and all that happened with David Montgomery in 2021 and 2022. Beyond that, no running back that's played with fields in his career has ever had either of those. So that's not very uh, promising for the running backs. And the same, th even with Russ, even though he did start throwing to the backs a little more once he got to Denver, after looking at the AYA app, neither their efficiency was really great to the running back. So even though Russ targeted the running backs a lot more, looking at the, basically their efficiency was not very good regardless of who, who the quarterback was, but at least we know that Russ will hopefully continue to target the running backs more. So at this point, unfortunately, it looks like if with all my Warren shares that I would prefer Russ, it hurts to say that it doesn't feel good saying that, but that's just kind of how I feel. Uh, I would agree with that. Like, you know, you mentioned the case where the Justin Fields selection. Justin Fields is somebody I'm adding at the end of drafts. And I think as the season goes on, he probably gets in as the starter. And I think he could, a bit like when you get a really low priced option in DFS, for example, and they can like break the slate that week. I think he could be the player if you're in the playoffs and he's playing that it's very hard to get that Russian profile at, at quarterback and the upside is huge. The one thing uh, I, I think more so I agree on the passes to running backs from the Russian quarterbacks. The other thing that maybe outside of David Montgomery that hasn't really happened that regularly with Justin Fields in his time in Chicago, there has been like, you know, a committee and also a committee of banged up running backs where a lot of running backs have missed chunks of the season. So there there may be an element to that, but I, I think it's more tied to less targets to uh, the running back position. And if you look at Fields across 2021 and 2023, what you've done in the article, you know, his short passes or his passes in general, you know, zero to 15 yards are dwarfed by the passes, uh, you know, going over just in terms of the overall percentage. We are seeing more targets to the short areas, but we're, you know, in terms of the success rate and what has been taken up in terms of the yards per attempt is a, a lot of, of difference in there. So not, not promising from that perspective. So then when we get to the outlook for 2024, What's your difference uh, when you use the range of outcomes here for between Jill and Warren and Najee Harris? And, and then how should we be playing it in, in drafts? We know we know how you're playing it. Uh, after doing the write-up and working through it, have you, you know, what is the upgraded or updated uh, thought process on the, the draft strategy here? So I uh, 
pretty much used Arthur Smith's. Uh, he ever their team averaged twenty nine pass attempts when he was with Atlanta. So that's kind of what I just carried over to what the Steelers' offense. You know, we what we could expect from them. So I basically just just kind of made a matrix, more or less, of what it would look like at with uh, different, basically different uh, target shares for each of the backs. So I basically have uh, Warren with. 15%, 12%, and 10%, just depending on any, basically, if Fields comes in, I'd said it, it could, his target percentage could drop by like a third, or his, and then Najee Harris is around 8%, 6%, 5%, and I gave them both about 200 carries. I feel like that the the work could evenly split out, and when, and I also used the, the average, career average of PPR per opportunity, which you can find in the, the uh, NFL player statistics app on, on Rotoviz. So after looking at the underdog ADP app uh, and just taking everything into account, there's really no way that Harris would outproduce Warren just with, based on their historical statistics. And ever since this article came out, I think this came out at the end of May, uh, Warren has actually stayed the same and Harris is actually climbing a little bit. So, <laughs> so obviously drafters are still getting it wrong. Um, you mentioned I, the underdog ADP. It's actually very interesting over at the FFPC in the best ball tournament, which, you know, I've been looking at some of the information uh, as those drafts are progressing. Jalen Warren is running back 25 in that format. Najee Harris is running back 26. They're back-to-back -back picks, mm. uh, you know, right in the eighth round. So it's interesting to see them 801, 802 by ADP in that particular format. So they're, they're neck and neck, and they're usually pretty close across all formats. But when you've put in the details of, what you said there about the target share 15 percent 12 percent 10 percent and worked out with the the russian as well we do get you know outcomes in terms of ppr for jill and warren as high as running back 11 but as low as running back 15 so there's not a huge differential there it's pretty close overall and then in half ppr running back 14 running back 19 but similarly when we work out the details for Harris, we get running back 31 through running back 33, which again, pretty, pretty close range, and then 33 to 34. So we are seeing a big difference between the two. Obviously, now we could go into the season, the splits could be flipped, and then we have, you know, 15% target for Najee Harris. But in that there particular case, you know, I, I don't see that being the case where Najee Harris is a clear pass catching back over a Jill and Warren and the, the splits are flipped to that dramatic nature. The other part then on it is, you know, we Jill and Warren could get injured as I talked at the start of the show, the player you're drafting could get injured. But that is factored in 200 rushing attempts for Najee Harris. But if Harris was to miss any time, that's obviously going to bump that up again in, in Warren's favor. So I guess what you're saying is uh, you're still drafting a lot of Jill and Warren at this point in time and he's, he's still criminally undervalued. Is that the yes. outcome? Yes, absolutely. And I said, Najee only really becomes interesting to me. I've seen him drop into the hundreds uh, on underdog, and that's really only the only place that I'm comfortable drafting him, but it seems like he's going the wrong way. <laughs> he's going I, up, not down. So I, I find it very challenging to draft him just with the other names that are in the same zone. He would nearly need, like you're saying, to be beyond the entire tier of running backs that I'm kind of targeting in that zero RB range before you would want to jump in and select them so that is Najee Harris the or Najee Harris and Jill and Warren but uh we are going to link both of these articles in today's show notes you can check out the full pieces with all the information that you know the charting and so on in there as well but the second player we are going to talk about today is a tight end so we're going to say X may just be the best tight end prospect we have ever seen but could his landing spot limit his ceiling player we're very excited about uh, over the years I have you know, become more an interested in drafting rookie tight ends. I used to be kind of let's it takes two or three years, but we have seen that change quite a bit in recent times. And the profiles of these players are so dramatically different. You know, the, the tight end position has evolved to the point where the athletic profiles that we see are different to anything we were seeing, you know, 10 years ago and how they are then used in the offenses, basically like a, a big wide receiver um, has changed as well. So, We've seen Sam Laporta come in. It didn't happen in his first year. We've seen Trey McBride, Dalton Kincaid. We're seeing these players come in that just, you know, are kind of breaking the, the mold. So this guy coming in has been touted by some as potentially, well, someone on the show as potentially the, the greatest tight end prospect of all time. Who is the tight end we're talking about and, and where do you want to start as we 
we break them down. I don't think this will come as any surprise to anyone listening right now, but it's it's Brock Bowers. I uh, like again, he was at one point this offseason. I was over fifty percent exposure to him, so I that's that's when I said I really needed to to take a deeper dive and really look at this because his landing spot with the Raiders was a little bit concerning, and I wasn't really sure if if that really would limit his upside. So if I was going overboard, the only thing kind of like you were talking about earlier with Trey McBride, the, the, with drafting so much bully tight end or double elite tight end, sometimes I would get to Bowers and I would already have two elite tight ends on my, on my roster. And that was I've really actually, the only thing I've run back. into that a, a few times as well, where, you know, Bowers has slid a little bit in drafts recently and you're looking at the best available players and I, I feel like he's clearly the best available players in that but I actually started a draft recently with Tom Strachan it's a slow draft in the FFPC where we had the 102 and we took uh Josh Allen but then on the way back we took Sam Laporta and on the, the 302 we took Dalton Kincaid so we've like you know trying to, to f- see some unique builds but yeah we had to pass uh on two picks then at a different turn on Bowers. We couldn't add the third tight end through those <laughs> those ranges. Uh, but Bowers at the minute going at this particular point in time over at the FFPC, and all these are very, very similar. When I mentioned FFPC or underdog with tight end 11, usually going in the nine through 11 range. But I have seen him, and I do think it's because it's a rookie tight end. I've seen him sliding at certain points. I do think as we're going to talk about in a moment, the Raiders, I think the Lanton spot, like if he's in a different Lanton spot, I think he's probably going you know, tight end seven at this particular point, uh, you know, leading with the trajectory of a Sam Laporta and what people thought from last year. And Laporta even last year was going in this range or slightly below it, even with a great loss, even at that point. But I think the potential range of outcomes, if you ask different fantasy football players or analysts around the industry, I think there's a wide range from like tight end five and breaking the game to, you know, undraftable at his ADP. So we're going to talk about why he is definitely draftable at his ADP. So where do you want to go? Do you want to go with the landing spot? Do you want to go with, you know, how good of a, a prospect this guy is coming in? Where do you want to go with it? Uh, like what I really wanted to do is, as as a generational prospect, especially a generational receiving prospect, I kind of went in and looked at how Brock Bowers compared to all the wide receivers that were first round picks every year of his career. And really, I just wanted to go into his freshman season because it's, it's really pretty mind blowing, like how good he even was as a true freshman. And, and these trends pretty much uh, just keep going across his entire college career. So when he came in as a true freshman was the year that, that we had Traylon Burks, Drake London, Jamison Williams, Garrett Wilson, and Jahan Dotson, and Chris Olave as first round picks and how he stacked up to them. Uh, he didn't get as many routes as them, but as far as like on an efficiency perspective, amongst all of those players, as far as targets per route run, he was fourth. Uh, receptions per route run, he was third. Yards per route run, he was third. Catch rate first. Yards per target third. Yards per reception third. Yards after the catch first. Yards after contact first. And evasion percent per, uh, evasion percentage, he was second. So like, as a true freshman competing against first round wide receivers i mean he was like top three uh, essentially across the board in all of those which is pretty amazing when you when you go and look at it um and then basically like i said those trends continue across his entire college career so i mean he really is he's essentially a first round wide receiver since he stepped foot in college yeah there is that part like if he was a wide receiver he, you know I think there'd be a lot more buzz around the same situation, even if he was a wide receiver Lanton with a target hog and Devonte Adams and Lanton, you know, with Michael Mayer, who a player again, I had hopes for last season, but it's not a good sign that they've dropped, you know, a generational player right on top of him at this particular point, but he may still factor in. There is opportunities there. You have Myers there. Uh, so when we look then at the landing spot and the other part to factor in here is the the quarterbacks and we get, you know, Aiden O'Connell, who played a bit last season for the team. Uh, obviously, we had multiple changes at the position in terms of Jimmy Garoppolo was there. There was lots of moving parts. But we also get, you know, Menchie Mania coming in, Menchie Magic, whatever we want to call it. He was with the Eagles last year, played a limited amount of time. But both of those guys are coming in. There's, you know, competition there for the, the starting job. But the other interesting part when we're factoring in, obviously, Devontae Adams is going to get the chunk of the targets here. But the second part is both those guys – you know, heavy usage off the the tight end and the limited sample size that we have mm-hmm. between them. So that would also 
potentially bode well for him. What are we looking at here is the you know the, the potential outcomes in this offense with the situation that he finds himself in. Well, I was pleasantly surprised when I looked into the entire Raiders situation. Uh, them bringing over Luke Getze from Chicago was not very uh, exciting. After, you know, Chicago wasn't necessarily a very exciting offense. I mean, after DJ Moore came in, it was a little more exciting. But uh, it was not really the, the name to really get people buzzing, I don't think. Yeah. And uh, But what, what was good was Cole Komet producing that offense. Uh, in 2022, they basically had no one else. I mean, Darnell Mooney. But he ended up being the tight end 7 in PPR, tight end 3 in FPOE. And then even after they brought in DJ Moore the following season... Uh, he actually had an even better season. Cause, well, you would think that maybe he would tail off just because of the lack of targets because it seems like 2022 happened almost out of necessity. But when after DJ Moore come, came in, I mean, Komet kept producing and it even hit pretty much his numbers across the board were pretty much better in 2023. So if anything else, it looks like, or if nothing else, it looks like Luke Getze will at least have some opportunities for the tight ends. And kind of like you said with Michael Mayer being there, uh, this is something I actually heard right after I put the article out. I was listening to Stealing Bananas and heard, you know, Ben Gretsch say something to the effect of, you know, having these two guys. I don't know, want to project it to this extent, but like basically, it could looking at how Gronk and Aaron Hernandez were used by the Patriots, like it could be something similar to that. They're both, I think. I mean, Mayer is still a really, really good prospect, and I don't want to really, I don't want to fade him completely because I feel like both of those tight ends could have an opportunity. It's not to say that they will, but I mean, it's exciting, especially those two and Devontae Adams. Uh, I kind of, I mean, I kind of hope Jake Jacoby Myers maybe gets pushed to the side a little bit, uh, but who's to say? I, we'll find out. But I mean, I still, I'm still excited about both of those tight ends, especially Mayor. I'd really probably only be grabbing in like FFPC where it's tight end premium at the end of drafts. I haven't really been taking them at all in any sort of underdog, but yeah. that might, that, that could end up being a mistake as well. So the, the part with that and factoring it in, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, tight ends taking some time, maybe Michael Mayer takes a into the second season. He, did show some flashes but it never just all clicked together you mentioned jacoby myers and he was you know a big piece of that offense last year coming over from the patriots i think that you know it wouldn't necessarily need for those guys to get faded out completely because it really is Devontae adams those two guys and brock byers but you have like you know trey tucker was there renfro was there there's not a huge amount of other pieces i think that are going to factor in so even if it is four players getting spread out targets i think the leaders of those players are going to be Bowers and Devonte adams and we did see a little bit of a tail off from adams uh you know in terms of career numbers so maybe that factors into potential decline here moving forward as well and opens up the pathway for some more targets and opportunities for them have you any preference to who ends up being the starting quarterback it, you know i think for the the raiders it's probably better if it's aiden o'connell the younger quarterback moving forward but I, I think that when we look at uh, Minshew, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. And then the final part that I would lean into it is in terms of the uh, ADP, where he is going. I mentioned tight end 11. That's after David Njoku, Jake Ferguson, George Kittle, Evan Ingram. Uh, I think he should be right there with the kind of George Kittle. So I think he should definitely be going ahead of the two guys that he's behind there. Um, I kind of have it that uh, in those order of those guys, out of Byers, and Njoku, and Ferguson, in terms of ranking them, but the final thing that I will mention, you mentioned uh, the Patriots and that obviously that's a unicorn part of the offense with those two tight ends and how good they were at that particular time. But we do see offenses and kind of ingenuity and in trying to change what teams are doing. We've seen teams try and take away some of the, the deep passing from the likes of the Chiefs and the, the Bills, for example. We've seen shifts around different parts of how teams are using motion and, and how teams develop. But it, sometimes there is cycles to it. And obviously the Patriots did it. There wasn't a huge amount of other teams that went with the kind of double tight end to a successful effect in the offense in, in recent times. But like even the likes of the Packers at the moment, they have two tight ends who are very athletic. I think we might see some teams start to try and do things to put a little bit more pressure then on on defenses from that perspective and, and change up schemes. So maybe we do see Myers and, and Bowers out there quite a bit together. It'll be interesting to see how that develops. But uh what are your 
QB thoughts and then how early should Brock Byers be getting drafted here? Well, as far as the, I've never been good, it's one of my one of my Achilles heels as a fantasy drafter. These kind of uh, quarterback situations, I've, I generally always seem to pick the wrong one. So, <laughs> so I really like that's why I generally defer to you know a couple of years ago with Geno Smith and uh, Drew Locke. I was on Drew Locke, so <laughs> so it was it was after I hear, heard you guys talking on OT that I finally got on Geno Smith. Like so, I pretty much defer as far as those go, and. Uh, I mean, honestly, perf- I would rather see Minshew, if, for fantasy purposes, I'd rather see Minshew take over because he's across his career. It's just a larger sample size. Yeah, it's much larger. He has shown that he likes to to target the tight end, and he has had some good efficiency when doing it. And the same with um, Aiden O'Connell last year. If you look at the AYA app, his top uh, adjusted yards per attempt is to Michael Mayer. So, I mean, I think both of them, just the type of, the, I guess, the archetype of quarterback they are is the type that's probably – going to you know not take a ton of chances they're gonna they're gonna lean on their tight ends so I mean I honestly I'm okay with either of them and that's something that one of the things that was obviously a little more concerning about the situation is like the quarterbacks aren't ideal <laughs> as far as getting getting creating high value uh, tight end prospects but I'm I'm happy with either of them coming in and, and taking that. And then, as you said, as far as the ADP, I mean, I feel the same way as far as he should be up around Kittle. I mean, that's, I'd be, I'd be comfortable drafting him at that point. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that he's going behind Jake Ferguson is just, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, that's a crime. You know, we said Jalen Warren's criminally undervalued, undervalued. And I feel like the fact that he's going behind Jake Ferguson is, is not, <laughs> is not, uh, it's definitely an exploitable, part of drafts this year he uh yeah definitely <laughs> i think I, I think too there's some of these you know when it comes to adp and there's certain players that i'm not targeting as much you know i can see why people may take a player when you're like david and joko had a great finish to a season for example and, and Byers is a rookie coming in in a, a difficult situation potentially but tight end 10 and tight end 11 back to back in the the sixth round in ffpc which is tight end premium jake ferguson's going as tight end nine but that's in the middle of the fifth round so a full round of adps which usually the the tricky part for me is the the full round of difference rather than you know tight end 11 versus tight end nine but people just sometimes see the position very very different and and you know i mentioned about how i would have seen it you know, five six years ago but maybe not targeting the rookie tight end so there's probably some of that factored in we've seen ferguson down the stretch as well have a uh you know a little bit of a breakout and had a huge playoff game as well against the packers when they lost in the last time people have seen him so it could be some of that factored in to it as well but that is where we're going to leave it we'll have both of those articles in the show notes as we get ready to to move forward here but as we move forward what's in the pipeline what have we got coming up on on road for for kevin here so I just released a uh, commander's article. Basically, I'm, I'm doing a lot of rookie content, just kind of going through all the rookies that I'm drafting a lot of and <laughs> that are interesting. And so I did a, a write-up on Jaden Daniels, Ben Sinnott, and Luke McCaffrey. It's just uh, basically just detailing more so. It's, it's de- detailing their dynasty value, but also looking at year one and seeing if they can be contributors in year one. Uh and what I found, if I can give just a little teaser from that, is go go check out Ben Sinnott. Check out the BSS. <laughs> check out all of that. Uh, even if, and especially if he doesn't necessarily produce, that's kind of covered in the article. If he doesn't produce in year one, go out and get him for Dynasty for year two because it's his comps are, are pretty pretty amazing. And uh, they say mouth-watering. They're, it's, you want Ben Sinnott on your Dynasty rosters. I'll just put it, leave it at that. So we do have, and just as a teaser, he is tight end 21 in round 13 over in a tight end premium format in the FFPC. People have been asking recently about some kind of later guys. I've been, as I mentioned, targeting a lot of the earlier guys, and we did get into a situation. This is a teaser for the shows that are going to come out next week in the Listener League, the OT Listener League. Myself and Sean did miss out on on the tight ends we wanted to get, and, and Synod came in as a rescue option for us. And, you know, at that particular price, when you're going with late round tight end, you're looking at the profiles of guys who can absolutely make a difference and you know it might not work out but that at that price it's factored in and the upside is, is huge so we will leave it there check out that piece up on rotaviz.com my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at over to marland my 
guest today on the show is rotaviz.com writer kevin safranik you can check out all his work up on rotaviz.com as well as the show notes of today's show and until we are back have a good one